Okay. We're on. All right. Well, tonight we'll go through Zephaniah, uh, uh, Zechariah, Haggai, uh, but not Malachi. We'll do Malachi next week. And uh, Zephaniah is an interesting prophetic book. Um, his name means the Lord hides. An interesting name. He uh, uh, was likely a descendant of Hezekiah's based on the genealogy because he mentions Hezekiah and it looks like that. Now this is not a serious issue for in interpretation, but uh, more of interest uh, in explaining the more extensive genealogy that he uses. Uh, where normally the, the prophets would just identify their father, you know, he says it's Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. So that would make him uh, of royal descent. He's a part of the nobility, but he's not in the line of kings. Uh, Josiah is uh, uh, a uncle third removed or something like that. He's a relative, but he's not uh, actually in the in the royal family. <coughs> um, and he, he's ministering, as you see, during the time of Josiah. So Josiah, in, in his reign, they've already been told that Judah faces conquest. Uh, and, uh, and Judah is facing exile. Uh, Hezekiah was told that. Josiah is aware of it. In fact, Josiah in his reforms, remember they found the, uh, the book of the law and they read it. And he said, oh man, we're under a curse. Let's find out what God's going to do to us. And he sent to Huldah, the prophetess, and she told him from God that uh, while you live, the nation will be spared, but after you're gone, it's over with. Uh, and so, uh, <coughs> in uh, 2 Chronicles 34, we're told that the reason God delayed the judgment during Josiah's days was his heart attitude. He had the right heart. And for his sake, God delayed judgment. Uh, it, it probably would have come during his days. He would have been the king of the exile. But instead, he's not. Now, what did, what did Josiah do once he got word? Yeah, once he got word from God that the nation was going to be spared while he was king, what's Josiah then do? Do you remember from uh, Chronicles? Eh, whatever. Yeah, and then, you know, that's what Hezekiah did. You know, when God said he got 15 more years, he partied. No, oh, wrong king, sorry. Yeah, no, but uh, <laughs> yeah, Josiah, first thing he does, he, he, repair, you know, he, he continues to repair the temple. And the ne next thing he does is he pushes for more reforms. In fact, I would say this, Josiah did the most to reform the nation. He did more than even King David. And I would suspect that Josiah was a more righteous king than even King David. Because where King David didn't get rid of the high places, Josiah did. He got rid of all the idols. He cleaned them out. And he not only did it in Judah, he went on up into, into what became Samaria. He went up into Assyrian territory while the Assyrians still have some power. And he goes up there and he, kill, he, he, he destroys their idols. He kills their false priests and prophets. And he fulfills a prophecy from way back in the days of Jeroboam I. Remember when Jeroboam built the altar at Bethel, a prophet of the Lord came up from Judah and said, your dynasty is going to end and this, this altar is going to be desecrated and the bones of the priests are going to be burnt on it someday in the future by a king named Josiah. I think he named the king. I can't remember for sure. I believe he named Josiah as the king that would do it. And so this is like 150, or actually more than 150 years later. Josiah fulfills it. He goes up there and he desecrates the, uh, the, the altar uh, and, and destroys the temple and gets rid of the golden calf and all those things. And it's very interesting because in, in, in that earlier story, if you remember, 
the prophet was told by God once he made the prophecy <coughs> to return to Judah and not stop for anybody. Don't eat, don't drink, don't do nothing. Just get out of town. And I believe the reason is because the whole point is he was holy, the nation of Israel was unholy. And he wasn't to have anything to do with it. It was unclean. And an old prophet in a town hears about him, sends him, says, God has revealed to me, you're supposed to come to my house and have dinner. And so, being dumb and young, he does. And in the middle of the dinner, God reveals to the old prophet, he's going to kill this young prophet for disobeying him. And he tells him, you're going to die. The lion's going to kill you. And sure enough, when he leaves, the lion jumps him, kills him, leaves his donkey alone. Uh, and when he's buried, the old prophet says, bury me with him. You know, they buried him in the prophet's tomb, and, and, and the prophet told his sons when he was dying, I want you to put my bones next to his bones. Because then I, my bones won't be pulled out of the tombs and used to desecrate this, this temple. And so when Josiah was desecrating the altar, they came to the grave of the prophet, learned that it was the prophet from Judah, and left that one alone. So the guy didn't get his bones disturbed. And uh, uh, so, so this is, this is the situation <coughs> that Zephaniah is prophesying in. Judah's doomed, but their doom is delayed because they have a righteous king who is trying to reform the nation. Now, his, in the his, his historical background, Judah was prospering at the time of, of, of Zephaniah's ministry. Judah actually prospered under, under Josiah. Things went well. Assyria was in decline by then. Babylon was slowly growing on the horizon. But Assyria would not collapse for you know, at least a few more years, and even though it was destined for extinction. Uh, the nation itself felt strong and safe, but again, they, they weren't really seeing what was going on. They just sensed the power vacuum that was occurring. And the reason was is because now all of Assyria's resources were being poured towards Babylon. They couldn't afford to try to hang on to their territory to the south of them. So Judah is able to expand their borders and expand their influence, and they feel strong. They feel capable. Uh, and, uh, you know, it would be like uh, one South American country attacking another. <coughs> they might feel very strong doing it, but that's because they haven't attacked anybody of significance. And uh, same thing there. Now, the issue in Zephaniah is that Josiah's reforms are not really impacting the people. He's trying his best, but it's not reaching the hearts of the people. They're going along with it because if you don't, the king kills you. But they're not going along with it because they want to be right with God. Uh, and Zephaniah is ministering at the same time that Jeremiah is during Josiah's early reign, if not later as well. And, uh, and so he's, you know, he's seeing things the same way that Jeremiah does. Jeremiah knew their doom was coming as well. Now the dominant theme in Zephaniah is the day of wrath on the world. The day of the Lord as it affects the world, worldwide day of wrath. You, know, you have the day of the Lord, and the day of the Lord is sort of a generic concept. And it's used for several different events, one of which is, of course, what we call the Great Tribulation, the, the, the 70th week of Daniel. But <clears throat> and in that one, in that day of the Lord, God will judge the whole world. But there are other days of the Lord, like the Babylonian conquest was the day of the Lord. The Assyrian invasion was the day of the Lord. There were other days of the Lord. And the idea of the day of the Lord is that it's the day that the Lord gets his revenge on the wicked. Uh, and so, in fact, there's one place that refers to us presently living in the day of the Lord. The, the church age is the day of the Lord, in, in one sense or another. But here, he's talking about there's a day of wrath. The message of the book is that God's judgment of all the world and restoration of Judah, because that's another dominant idea here, is even while he's judging the world, he's going to restore Judah. And that's the motivation for believers to live righteously. And we have a reason to live. Now, broad outline. This is how I outline it. It's just three chapters. It's a small book. But the first chapter 
looks about, talks about how both the world and Judah will be judged. Both the world and Judah will be judged. That's chapter 1. Uh, <coughs> excuse me for coughing. I, one of the side effects of this, the more I talk, the more I cough. But uh, chapter 2 talks about how Judah's enemies will be destroyed. Judah's enemies will, will be destroyed. And then chapter 3, Judah will be restored to the land. Notice the theme of restoration again is in the prophets. Uh, which two prophets don't have the theme of restoration in them? Nahum. Nahum. Good. Jonah. No, not Jonah. Actually, Jonah does too. Yeah, that's true, Jonah does too. <laughs> Yeah, Nathan, Jonah, then there's a third. Obadiah, because he addresses Edom. So, you know, Edom's not going to be restored, and Assyria's not going to be restored. <laughs> They're out of luck. Well, we begin with chapter 1, and in chapter 1 again, we see that God's judgment of the world includes Judah. Uh, and he begins by saying that God is going to judge the whole world. I will utterly consume everything from the face of the land, says the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the birds of heaven, the fish of the sea, and the stumbling blocks along, the, uh, along with the wicked. I'll cut off man from the face of the land, says the Lord. And I'll stretch out my hand against Judah. So it's not just uh, worldwide judgment, but Judah will face God's judgment as well. And the reason is, we see beginning here, in verse 4 is, I will cut off every trace of Baal from this place. The names of the idolatrous priests, those who worship the host of heaven, those who worship and swear, and swear by the Lord, but who also swear by a milk hump. <laughs> Again, people were syncretizing. They were, you know, they were covering all their bases. And God didn't accept that. He didn't accept any other gods besides him. I shall have no other gods besides me. So God made that clear. And he's not willing to share the spotlight with any others. Uh, and so he's going to get those who've turned back from following the Lord and have not sought the Lord nor inquired of him. So God's going to judge Judah for her idolatry, for her disloyalty. <coughs> and this is much like we're going to see in Zechariah. And that is when God brings about this day of the Lord, the unrighteous Judeans or the unrighteous Israelites will die in the purge. They will be cleaned out. And uh, Zechariah tells us that it will be two-thirds of Israel will die. Only one-third will survive. Only one-third will be righteous before God. And so he warns them of this and this. And uh, he, you know, he goes on to say, uh, beginning in, in verse 14, the great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There the mighty men shall cry out. The, the day is a day of wrath, the day of trouble and distress, the day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities and against the high towers. So this is a time when when the cities of Judah will face intense judgment and destruction. And he uses this pictorial language to describe this day of the Lord. Uh, and, of course, we know that, again, there's two uses of the day of the Lord here in the sense of the Babylonian conquest that's coming. That's the day of the Lord. And that's what is, is the near fulfillment of this. But there's also the coming 70th week of Daniel, which will be described as this. And I don't know if you recognize this language, but this is sort of similar to the language that, that you see in other places describing the day of the Lord. This is like in Joel. Uh, and uh, similar again, but not the same as what Peter said. Peter's actually quoting from somewhere else. But uh, God is going to bring distress upon men, uh, he says, because they have sinned against the Lord. And notice their blood will be poured out like dust, their flesh like refuse, <coughs> Uh, their money won't be able to save them in the day that God's wrath is coming. Uh, and uh, it, 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 it'll be a time that no one can escape. So he announces this. Now remember, he announces this in the midst of their king trying to reform people spiritually. He says, this day is coming. There'll be no escape. 
Why? Again, because their hearts are not right. They're not right with God. So this leads to the second chapter where, where God then promises to take care of their oppressors. Notice. <coughs> Um, you know, gather yourselves together, uh, O oh, undesirable na nation. Uh, why? Before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you, seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, you who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness, seek humility. It may be that you'll be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Again, notice, he said, you know, it's a call to the righteous to seek God, it's a call to the, to the believers. To seek God so they can be spared. And again, we'll see again. Uh -huh. that, that's not a guarantee, is it? He's not guaranteeing um, <laughs> that he'll be spared. No. No. In fact, what we learned is, is for example, during the Great Tribulation, uh, there will be millions of martyrs who won't survive, but they were righteous. So, yeah, it's not a guarantee. But in, there is one guarantee. Only the righteous will survive. So if you're not righteous, you have no chance. If you are righteous, you may make it. That's, that's really what it boils down to. Um, <coughs> you know, if you're not righteous, you will be judged. If you are righteous, you may be martyred. But it's interesting because in Revelation, that's victory. So the martyrs get special rewards in heaven. So it's a good thing to be martyred. It's a bad thing to be judged. <laughs> you know, so if you're going to die, die for the right reason. Now, he goes on. Notice, uh, beginning in verse 4, he, he mentions Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, uh, the, the, the Cherethites. Again, those are the Philistines. Uh, <clears throat> so the Philistine cities are named. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, Gath isn't mentioned. Why is that? It was one of the five Philistine cities. Wasn't at that time, though, was it? No, it was conquered. It, yeah, it, no, it was completely wiped out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not just conquered, exterminated. Yeah. yeah, they were gone. They were gone for gone. And uh, so they're not mentioned, because they ain't around anymore. But... Uh, <coughs> Uh, this judgment is is coming upon the Philistines, um, and uh, in verse eight he begins talking about Moab and Ammon. Uh, and surely, you know, verse nine, surely Moab will be like Sodom, and the people of Ammon like Gomorrah, overrun with weeds and salt pits, and a perpetual desolation. So the destruction of them is going to be complete. Um, and then uh, in verse 13, or actually 12, he talks about the Ethiopians. 13, he talks about Assyria and Nineveh. Uh, and it's interesting, notice how he, how he describes it. He says, he'll stretch out his hand against the north, destroy Assyria, and make Nineveh a desolation. That was coming. As dry as the wilderness, the herd shall lie down in her midst. Every beast of the nation, both the pelican and the bitten, shall lodge on the capitals of her pillars. Their voice shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be at the threshold. For he will lay bare the cedar work. This is the rejoicing city that dwelt securely, that said in her heart, I am it, and there is none besides me. How has she become a desolation, a place for beasts to lie down? Everyone who passes by her shall hiss and shake his fist. So the total destruction of Nineveh is, is, is promised here. This goes along with Nahum's prophecy, where it won't be inhabited anymore. Just animals. And that is what happened to it. It was fulfilled in that way. But we see that uh, uh, this judgment of God on, on both Judah and her neighbors is going to be a very thorough judgment. Uh, the Babylonians accomplished this. And I would see this having been fulfilled then. Uh, but uh, it may also still yet be fulfilled a second time in the day of the Lord. In the, uh, you know, during the Great Tribulation. But notice, at the center of this was the reminder 
that for the righteous, there was hope if they remained righteous. There is this promise. Um. <coughs> now, in chapter 3, God then begins to address the issue of Judah itself. I talk about Jerusalem. You know, Woe to her who is rebellious and polluted to the oppressing city. She has not obeyed his voice. She has not received correction. She has not trusted in the Lord. She has not drawn near to her God. Her princes in her midst are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave not a bone till morning. Her prophets are insolent, treacherous people. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. Uh, you know, what an indictment against the city of Jerusalem. And the basic bottom line is, everybody there is corrupt. Of course, we understand, except Josiah. But you can see why, no matter how hard Josiah is working, I mean, he's gone through just about everybody here. Even the prince is in our midst. Uh, <coughs> you know, just about everybody but the king. And so that's why Josiah, as hard as he worked, couldn't accomplish anything. That had to be very, very disappointing, dis discouraging. And, uh, and Zephaniah sees this. And so, notice what he says, beginning in verse 8. Wait for me until the day I rise up for plunder. My determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms, to pour on them my indignation, all my fierce anger. You know, so again, he promises, I'm going to judge all the nations. But he says, wait for me. Who's, who's he telling to wait for them? The righteous. The righteous. Be patient. God is at work. Why? Verse 9, For then I will restore to the people a pure language, that they all may call on the name of the Lord to serve Him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. In that day you shall not be shamed for any of your deeds in which you transgress against me, for then I will take away from your midst those who rejoice in your pride, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. I will leave in your midst a meek and humble people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness and speak no lies. So notice what he's saying. The proud and the wicked I'm going to purge, and all that's going to be left are the meek and the humble. Remember what Jesus said? Who gets to enter the kingdom of heaven? Of theirs is the kingdom of heaven? The meek. The meek. The peacemakers. The pure of heart. The pure of heart. These same kind of people. And when he's saying this, they should have been thinking about this. Going, yeah, yeah, you know, that's exactly what Zephaniah said too. And I don't know if you noticed this, but those verses I read, they are allusions to the new covenant. The forgiveness of sin and these things. They're similar to Jeremiah 31, the new covenant. Uh, Ezekiel 36, the new covenant. Same kind of things. So, this restoration is really looking toward the time of the New Covenant. It was not the restoration to Judah in 60 B.C. or 90 B.C. Actually, I guess it would be 100 or something. Until 65 B.C. when the Romans came in. But uh, <coughs> it's not an allusion to that. It's, it's talking about the future restoration of the nation after the ultimate day of the Lord. That's, that's what he's really talking about here. Well, it's, uh, it sounds like that pastors and mission parish on verse 8 should be praying for disaster so that the people's hearts will be melted, the remnant will yeah. really be genuinely mm -hmm. revived, yeah. and then you'll have, uh, you know, but, but I guess that's not what you're saying. That's not what the book is saying. I mean, disaster isn't going to change people's no. mind either. No, no, it's not. Exile, banishment, horrible... You it's know, not going to change your mind. Nothing's going to change anybody's mind until the Lord is the says, the now it's time, this one and this one and this one. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's counter to... And in fact, those who might be marginally spiritual, marginally righteous, when these bad times come, when the <coughs> day of the Lord comes, 
Only the remnant of them will turn to the Lord. The rest of them will fall away. But there's nothing. This is my. This yeah. is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. Trying to learn. And I don't know that you can even learn that. Yeah. But it sounds like there's not. It's it's purely a Calvinist. What super lapsarian or what? It's purely a Calvinist thing. Yeah, unless I mean, there's a work of you, God. Doesn't that put you all the way back to five points? I mean, nothing, nothing we can do. Is there anything we can do? I mean, we say we hear, but we really don't hear. Well, actually, no, actually, the way Zephaniah is speaking, we are responsible to respond. And that uh, uh, a person facing the day of the Lord faces one of two choices. Am I going to live righteously and have this opportunity to be restored by God? Or am I going to follow the wicked paths that my nation has been following and be destroyed by God? And uh, actually, it's quite Armenian in the sense that this day of destruction is coming. But Zephaniah here makes it clear that it's the choices you make that will determine where you end up. So he's focusing on the human responsibility. He's focusing on the destiny of this coming day of the Lord. It's coming. Can't avoid it. And in it, God's going to purge the wicked and wipe out these nations. But for this remnant who wants to be restored, you need to make a choice. So it's, it's really looking at God sovereignly affecting history, but his readers need to choose to obey. Choose to be righteous. And notice, choose to be righteous from the heart and to humble right. themselves before God. It's not just and, and of course, we know from New Testament teachings that that is a work of God within the person. Again, God is intimately this involved. This isn't signing a card and, no. and going to the altar and getting back. This isn't this no. junk we do today. No. This is all out. I am destroyed unless you're there, Lord. I yeah. mean, I'm gone. I'm done and it's the day-to-day -day living. And, and if, you don't, if you're not there for me today, I'm undone. I'm totally yeah. gone. Mm -hmm. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah. And it's, I am committing myself to obeying you, even though my society is not. I'm not following the trends of my society. I'm going to go against the trends. I'm going to go against the, the flow. And I'm going to be obedient to you. But we try to come up with a formula. Like I said, you know, this is the kind of guy, guy God chooses. He chooses a poor guy who's been beat up by his brothers. You know, he hasn't got anything. He's barefoot. He's, you know, this is yeah. a guy. Yeah, he's going to be, God's going to pour out his spirit on that guy. And that doesn't work either. Because it could be a rich guy. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's why the, the, the sovereignty versus this responsibility yeah. keeps coming in here. Yeah. And how do you explain this to a parishioner, you know, somebody in your congregation? Well, I think, I think what you do is you skip the sovereignty, or you skip the election side of it, and you focus on human responsibility. Because that's the point of Zephaniah's third chapter, is if you want to be a part of this righteous remnant who gets restored, You've got to live a righteous life. And it's a call to righteousness. Under the ground, on, on the grounds that God is going to destroy all the wicked. And the only ones who have a chance, literally who have a prayer of a chance, of getting through the day of the Lord, are those who choose to obey the Lord. Who choose to live righteously. So, therefore, you better start making that choice. And uh, I think that's, that's the message of Zephaniah. This day of the Lord is coming, and if you want to be a part of the restoration, you need to be living for the Lord now, not when the day of the Lord gets here. Because if you're not living for the Lord when the day of the Lord comes, you're going to get wiped out. You're, you'll be a part of the purge. But if you are living for Him, then you'll survive or have a better chance of surviving. Because, again, like we know, not all the righteous will survive in the end. It'll only be a remnant. But now we know, again, from other teaching, that this is only going to happen because of God's work in people's lives. God's enablement. And, uh, yeah. It's an amazing mystery. Yeah. I mean, he's sovereign. He is sovereign. I mean, pastor still has to get this pretty well down. Yeah. You can't preach it if you've got doubts about it. Mm. It's very difficult. Yeah. <clears throat> But then it's his, it, it, it's, it must be part of this, he's wrapped himself in darkness. I mean, there's things that we can know, he's given us to know, and they're just things we have to say, there's no way I can understand yeah. this, but both are true. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's all you can do, right? 
Do you have any secrets? Any? If you do, I no. want to know. Well, I like it. I like it the way that Criswell, W. A. Criswell, put it. I live my life like an Arminian, but I assure myself like a Calvinist. <laughs> you know, he didn't. He, he, he didn't use those terms, but you know, we are supposed to have because. The doctrines of election is given to Christians to comfort us. That I know that it's not dependent on me. It's a work of God and so that I can relax. But yet the commands of Scripture all involve my will and the choices I make. And Jesus says, I'm going to come and I'm going to hold you accountable for those choices. So in some sense I have a free will. But in another sense I don't. And I think the sense that I don't is in the determining of my destiny. But the sense that I do is in determining my, as we call it, rewards. Uh, it, you know, it has an impact. Paul himself knew he was destined for heaven, but he didn't know if he was going to be rewarded in heaven until 2 Timothy. When he writes to Timothy that last time, it says, I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've entrusted him until that day. I have finished the race. I have fought the fight. It's done with. I can't blow it. I'm in my cell. I can't blow it because the next thing to happen is I'm going to lose my head over the situation. And, uh, and so my ministry is done and I haven't failed. But our, earlier in Philippians, he talked about pressing towards the goal, the prize. In other words, I can miss it. And you know, I've got to be careful lest I be disqualified before I arrive. So even the Apostle Paul faced the reality that he could fail based on choices he made. But at the end, he knew he'd made the right choices. Of course, that's all of our goals. You know, I want to be able to, when I'm lying on my deathbed, uh, and I know that I'm not going to be around much longer, to know that I was faithful to the end. Not lie there with regrets, saying, you know, I really don't want to have to go see the Lord now. Because we're going to begin my my stint in heaven with a hour and a half long chewing out. <laughs> or maybe it'll be a year and a half long chewing out. You know, I, I tell people, I want to die in the process. You know, if, if I die suddenly, I want to die serving the Lord. I don't want to die in the middle of a sin. <laughs> you know. What if you're hammering up or laying some tile and you cut your hand and then you say, you say the wrong word because you, you know. And then bleed to death, right? You, yeah, you, you cut your hand and you get real upset. You say the wrong thing and you're raptured the same second. Very embarrassed. This, this is not being paid, of course. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I'd, be very, I'd be very embarrassed when I see Jesus. Yeah. But you know, there, there's a neat thing about serving the Lord faithfully. Just, just as an aside, I don't know if I've told you all about that. One of my uh, friends in, in seminary took a, a pastorate up in the Seattle area. And uh, I think he was only 42, 42, 43, young guy. Had a massive heart attack in the middle of a racquetball game. You know, so he, he died happy. I don't know if he, if he was ahead or behind him. Was he winning? But uh, the neat thing is, he was, he was playing racquetball with the men he was discipling. He was in the middle of ministry, serving the Lord. And uh, suddenly, you know, basically blinks, wakes up in heaven. Uh, and I think, you know, of course it's sad to lose a friend, but at the same time, there's a certain joy knowing that this, you know, when he saw Jesus, he was busy serving Jesus. You know, so, you know, when he looks up and he sees Jesus, you know, he wasn't goofing off. Just like one of the guys from my college went over to England uh, for some missions work this last, was it last summer? Or the summer before last? No, this last summer. Uh, and again, had a massive heart attack and died. Uh, and uh, so, you know, he wasn't expecting it. Uh, but it's neat to say, you know, this guy, when he did come into Jesus' presence, he came into his presence while he was busy out witnessing about Jesus to a bunch of Muslims. I, I, I think it was a Muslim community they were trying to penetrate uh, in, in the London area or something like that. I mean, so, you know, uh, he's. He was get, giving himself to the Lord. And that's a neat thing. But that's that's a part of this thing. It's it's 
you say, well, it, you know, he was destined to die that day, and, and God uh, knew that, and yet, you know, uh, he made choices that had, at the time of his death, him you know, intimately involved in serving the Lord. You know, better that than someone sitting there disqualified because of their morality or because of bitterness and anger and things like that and be eliminated from serving the Lord uh, and then get sick and die. You know, we want to die by serving. And here, the call again was to the remnant to be faithful so when the day of judgment came, they might be spared. I'll guarantee but with, a, <coughs> but with the guarantee that if they were goofing off, they wouldn't survive. Well, that's Zephaniah. That's Zephaniah. Now, we'll move to Haggai, but let's take a break first. Haggai, again, is a fun, fun prophet. Haggai and Zechariah uh, prophesied together. Uh, the location of these prophecies is uh, identified as Jerusalem, Judah, by reference to Zerubbabel being governor of Judah. So Haggai is a post-exilic prophet. Uh, he provides dates for each of his sermons, and uh, so it helps us to place his ministry in time. The first date uh, was the first day of the month of Elul in the second year of Darius, Castaspes. Uh, <clears throat> that tells us he prophesied on August 29th, 520 B.C. We can figure it out right to the point. Um, you know, his second date uh, in uh, chapter 1, verse 15 was 23 days later, so we know that's September 21st. <coughs> chapter 2 begins with the 21st day of the seventh month, Tishri. Thus, that was October 17th. And then the last date given uh, in uh, 210 and 220, the 24th day at Chislev, or 18th of December. So, <laughs> his, his whole ministry covers less than four months. At least his written records of these messages that that he delivered, uh, and uh, they were probably composed that December or very soon afterwards, around 519 BC. Okay, so that would be about 20 years after Babylon fell to the Medes and the Persians. Remember, Babylon falls in 539, so he's prophesying 20 years later. 2 Chronicles 36, verses 22 to 23, places the decree by which the captives returned to build a temple under Zerubbabel's leadership within Cyrus's first year as king. Uh, it was delayed by Artaxerxes, okay, but it was restarted by one of the Dariuses. So Haggai and Zechariah are identified by Ezra as contemporaries who prophesied, whose prophecies spurred the people to complete the task of rebuilding the temple. And that's in Ezra chapter 5 where we see that. So that's sort of where things fit. Now, Haggai's audience, of course, are the Jews who have returned to Judah under Zerubbabel. Uh, he addresses actually Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest, who's there. Uh, and so they're, they're addressed directly, but the people under them are indirectly addressed. Uh, the first oracle was for Zerubbabel and Joshua. The second one addressed the two leaders as well, and also the remnant, the people who had returned. The third addressed Joshua, the priest, and then the fourth address is Zerubbabel. So they're, they are primarily focused on the leaders, but the people, the righteous remnant also. Now, the the background to this prophecy is, is Zerubbabel had returned with uh, the first group about 18 years earlier. They had experienced pressure from the peoples around them. If you remember from the book of Ezra, uh, you had the, uh, the, the Samaritans and the Arabs and all living around them who then began to pressure them because they wanted to come help build the temple. They said, no, you can't. We're supposed to do it ourselves. And so then they stopped the work on the temple. Um, so under the threat, they, they left the temple alone to get the pressure off. And then they went about their business of fixing their farms and fixing up their houses and setting up their businesses. They got busy doing that. And basically, 
Yeah, just never got back around to doing the temple. But they were commanded to get, I mean, Artaxerxes mm -hmm. said you'd have to stop, right? So they had to Later stop. Later on, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But he was disposed or something. Yeah. So they could have started back earlier. Isn't they could have. Yeah, they could have. Well, how long was that about, you think? I mean, a few, eight years? Or, instead of 16 years? It, oh, yeah, they could have started back within just uh, you know five or ten years after the thing. But it was a legitimate delay at first, wasn't it? What no. What did we say? No. Well, but then they had, didn't they get an order? It was a cowardly delay. But they got an order from the head? The well, eventually head. they did, yes. Eventually they got an order to stop. And then they stopped. But they could have kept going until then. Oh. Well, it's a little confusing because yeah. they start, they're stopped, then they start again, and then they complete. Yeah. It sounds like school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's kind of sad, but... Yeah. Same sort of thing. So, uh, <coughs> the circumstances reflected in Ezra and Nehemiah are the circumstances that it motivated God to raise up these prophets, both uh, Haggai and Zechariah, to encourage the people to complete the task of rebuilding the temple and of serving Him because they were neglecting God. You know, they, and they were satisfied because they had the altar built, they had the sacrificial system going again, but there was nothing else. So they were satisfied with the minimum. That would be the way to think about it. And, uh, and God had sent them back to build the temple. So, now if, if you remember, the first group of captives was carried to Babylon in 605 B.C. Uh, and uh, the most complete exile came with the destruction of the temple in 586. And the last of the people gets hauled off then. Now, corresponding to these dates with regard to the 70 years prophecy, uh, you know, Jeremiah had said that the land would lie desolate for 70 years to make up for all the Sabbaths that the nation had missed, the Sabbath years. Uh, and so it's interesting because the return under Zerubbabel in 537 was two years before the 70th anniversary of the first fall of Jerusalem and the hostages which were carried off. So 68 years after that. And some people try to say, well, that was the 70 years because... The, Babylon, you know, the, the land of Judah was, de was destroyed for the two years prior to Jerusalem's fall. It had already been invaded. There was a siege of Jerusalem, and then Jerusalem fell. So, you can count it that way. Now, here's an interesting thing, though. Uh, when Haggai began his ministry, he seemed to be responding to the recognition that in just a couple of years the temple would have been destroyed for 70 years. So in fact, it was about 70 years from the time of the destruction of the temple until the rebuilding was completed. So that may have been the desolation. It's more likely the first one because the land lay empty for at least 50 of those 70 years with no occup occupation. And the Sabbath rest was for the land, not for the temple. But both the temple's destruction was about 70 years, as well as the land's thing. So now the issue in this book is the need to finish rebuilding the temple. I mean, that's the whole point. And so the dominant theme of, of uh, Haggai is the rebuilding of the temple. And his message is that the obedience to God in rebuilding his temple is brought about by God's discipline and results in blessing. See, God had begun to put pressure on them to get them to rebuild the temple. And he's doing it in the Deuteronomic way, I guess you'd say. He's doing it the exact way he said he'd do it in Deuteronomy. And he's beginning at square one again. With mildew and famine and, and, uh, <coughs> and drought and those kinds of things. He's putting economic, agricultural pressure on them because they're being disobedient. And in Deuteronomy, it said, if you're disobedient, here's the stages, the steps of discipline. And so it's really beginning once again. Uh, and so God's discipline is beginning to be felt by the people. And uh, 
And what it means is they need to start obeying the Lord, specifically in rebuilding his temple because he commanded them to do it. Broad outline of the book. I would outline it, of course, it's just two chapters. So chapter one is the need to rebuild the temple. And chapter two is the promise that God will bless. Now, in this book, there are two key players, both Zerubbabel and Joshua. They're the key people that are addressed. Zerubbabel is a governor. He is a direct descendant of King David. He would have been king if they had not been in captivity. He is, as, but now, because of their overlords, he is just a governor. Just a governor. Joshua is the high priest. He came back with Zerubbabel, and he's been serving as a high priest, and he would have been the legitimate heir to the high priesthood. So his first message here in chapter 1 is the need to rebuild the temple. And he begins by calling them. And notice their sin. He says, you know, thus speaks the Lord of God. These people says, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Consider your ways. And now here's where we see the discipline of the Lord. Use so much and bring in little. You eat, but don't, don't have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put in a bag of coals. Consider your ways, says the Lord. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build a temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified. You look for much, but indeed, it's come to little. And when you brought, brought it home, I blew it away. Why? Says the Lord of hosts. Because of my house. That's in ruins. While every one of you runs to his own house. And uh, so he talked about how he's withholding the dew and he's keeping them, you know, he's causing droughts and he's causing mildew and he's punishing them. Um, okay. Significance of paneled houses. How do they normally make their houses? Stones. Yeah, they built them with stones. And then Panel they, the inside is, is a luxury. Item. Yeah, it's, it's a luxury. luxury item. Wainscoting is, is an example today. I mean, yeah. Not heard that is the last 50 years. You put wainscoting, if you had a little extra money, yeah. cover up the old lap and plaster like it's in my house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> With wainscoting. Right. That was, that's considered panel. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the typical house back then was plastered. They would build it with the stone walls, and then they would plaster the inside wall. Uh, and maybe paint it white or something like that, or, or, or paint it various colors. But it's plastered. Yeah, to to panel it, and and they're not using plywood paneling. They're using boards. You know, t probably tongue and groove boards, just like we would do. It's quite expensive. That means you're in luxury. So these people have now. They've not just recovered. They're doing well, and they're making luxury homes. They are putting their energies into really making life nice, is the whole point. Uh, now, I believe the general consensus at this time is everybody built stone houses. I'm not sure that they did. They probably were wooden houses as well, but they've all rotted away. But then again, the wooden house wouldn't have paneling automatically. Uh, paneling was a luxury item. Same thing that wouldn't have wooden floors. The typical Jewish house is a dirt floor. Uh, and so to have a wooden floor was a luxury item as well. But, though it's, it's not mentioned here. But, you know, the real issue here then is misplaced priorities. <clears throat> what they're doing is not evil in the sense that, you know, making your house nice is not a bad thing. But it's doing it at the expense of God's work. And that's what's not good. You know, what can be good if it interferes with what God wants you to do, it becomes bad. 
And uh, that's really what had happened. And of course the consequence is God had cursed them. <coughs> their money was falling through, you know, a hole in the pocket. Uh, their grave was being blown away. <coughs> their wine was leaking. Things were happening. And so, you know, God was getting their attention. Huh? I gotta ask. It's probably a yes, I'm guessing. Does God still do this today? I, mean, I think so. Not on a national level, maybe like this kind of but individual. I think sometimes he does, yeah. Now here's the problem. You have to ask the question now. If, you know, if I'm having a series of bad bad luck, is it God punishing me or is it just I'm being tested for my patience or is it just a part of life? See, and I wouldn't have wondered but Greek class, maybe there's sin in your life. Yeah. <laughs> but that sticks in my head. Yeah. And, you know, so many things string together and you ask yourself, and then, you know, we had to do this, you know, our, our look at Haggai 1 for our response. I'm thinking, yeah, yeah. my kid, I think he's going to be in hospital again tonight. You know, you just like, tons of things are going wrong, and one of the first things you think of, hey God, you're doing this on purpose. Why? Yeah. Now, I don't know. What you have to do is you have to stop and evaluate, and you ask the question: Am I living for the Lord, or am I not? That's so beautiful. And if I'm living for the Lord and I'm living in dependence on Him, then it's a test, not a punishment. I mean, look at Job. The whole point of Job is that Job was put through horrible trials because they were designed to be trials. It wasn't because of any particular sin. But if I stop and look at my life and I say, you know, I have this attitude or I'm doing this conduct and I've been consistent in it, maybe this is what God is trying to get my attention for. I know for me, I have seen that at times. And it has to do with relationships. It has to do with attitudes. It can be subtle things. Because, in fact, the more responsibility God gives you, the more these little areas you become accountable for. Uh, and the older you get, there are certain things that God let me get away with when I was in my 20s that He won't let me get away with anymore. It's terrible. <laughs> and uh, a part of His plan was He had me marry my wife. She won't let me get away with it. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I've been getting lectures about, you know, you're over 50 now, and you're supposed to act like it. <laughs> and then she complained the other day, you're acting like an old man. <laughs> no. I feel old. You can't win. I can't win, yeah. And, uh, that board's too low, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's, uh, but you know, that's the thing is, but there's a real truth in what she said to me about that. You know, there are certain things that it is time for me to act a certain way. Uh, and this happened to me back when I was 30. When I had my 30th birthday, someone came up to me and said, you know, you're 30 now. Start acting like it. Because I, I, you know, I was in the dorm in seminary, and I was pulling pranks and all the kind of stuff like I did in college and enjoying myself <laughs> thoroughly. But I wasn't 18 anymore. And let me tell you, I pulled some good pranks in college. Probably, uh, no, I don't think I'd go to jail for any of them nowadays. But, uh, <clears throat> but you know, uh, so yeah, sometimes it is God's discipline. But other times it's not. Other times it is God teaching us things. Now, it may be a combination of the two also. And some of it, you know, uh, may, may be simply factors like you have a series of accidents because you're working too hard and not getting enough rest and you're losing your coordination. You know, and so you break things and drop things and that kind of stuff. I, I, I've had that happen. Uh, where, you know, I stopped to realize, you know, I'm just simply too fatigued. I just need to sleep for a couple days and then I'll be fine and I'll stop tripping over myself. Or, you know, like right now, I've got this wonderful cold that's going around. You know, and it has a big impact. Oh, I have a question that maybe you can analyze. <clears throat> uh, David went to the Lord and said, I want to build you a temple. And the Lord said, I've lived in these tents. I don't need a temple. Besides, you're not, you know, beside the fact that you're not worthy to build it, yeah. your son will build, uh, your son will build a temple. But I don't need a temple. 
and now they're getting disciplined. And I know there's an answer to this, but I just want to hear your answer. I don't, I'm not sure I know the right answer, but I know there is an answer. Um, you know, now they're getting disciplined for building the temple. Mm -hmm. That's, We're that's not a good, that's a, this was a good one to teach yeah. on, right? Well, but oh, yeah. at, at that time, I don't think they even had the tent either. Right, they don't have the tent yeah. either. But also, see, well, when, when no, David addresses them, yeah, God's response to David was, uh, David, I appreciate your hard attitude, but if it was an issue with me at this time, I'd have brought it up to you, and it's not. I'm satisfied with the tabernacle. But if David hadn't done it, God would have said, told Solomon, I want a temple now, and I want it in Jerusalem. Now, when Solomon, you remember when Solomon inaugurated the temple, or dedicated the temple, not inaugurated dedicated to that he prayed to God and asked God to, to accept their prayer there and God said yes I will dwell here and I will listen and all this kind of stuff so it's on the basis of the promise that he made to Solomon that a new temple had to be built so that, that, that there would be the temple for them to pray to where God's presence would be so God had made a promise and this was the way to com continue to fulfill that promise so in that sense the circumstances had changed God still really didn't need a temple. He's bigger than the universe. But for the sake of the promise he made to Solomon, the covenant he had with Solomon, it had to be built. But we don't read, we don't read for the, like the Spirit of God leaves the temple in Ezekiel. Right. But we don't read him coming back. No, in fact, Ezekiel tells us he won't come back until a millennial temple. Ah, great answer. <laughs> yeah. Now, where is the ark? supposedly during the 70 years of captivity? Um, we have no idea. Because the Bible doesn't really say, and the ark popped back up, but can, it, can, it, can when the Lady and Maya's row built the temple and they reinstate you know, all the temple, the ark is there. No. It's never mentioned. So that argument is by assumption. We assume it's there. Yeah. So just because it says all its furnishings, that doesn't necessarily mean... Because in Herod's temple, right. it, it seems to indicate it's there. Yeah, it seems to me there, there was a reappearance of it. So yeah, so we're, I mean... No, I'm not, I don't remember that it's mentioned anywhere. I don't think it is in, in Herod's temple. Mm. Maybe I read that in some... Yeah, as far as we know, it either got carried off by the Babylonians... Which is the most likely thing, or it's still uh, yeah, it's it got buried somewhere and it's still there. Now it may be that it was amongst the items that the Babylonians carried off and was brought back, which means it might have been around all the way until the Romans destroyed it. Well, the, but it, there's no indication. Uh -huh. The temple though wasn't the uh, mercy seat for the blood to be poured out upon the top of. Sprinkle on, yeah. 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 So what'd they do on the on Yom Kippur? They just go sprinkle the the spot. Now I'm just going to the Holy of Holies and sprinkle it on any spot. Yeah. On, on the Ark of Titus it shows them carrying a box. I mean it has a menorah on top of yeah. it, but I don't know. I mean, it could just be a box they're carrying stuff in, but it yeah. seems to look like the ark, the ark, yeah. <coughs> they may have had it. They may have had it until the Romans destroyed it or whatever. Yeah, we don't know. That's that's one of those mysteries. There's nothing in writing. They've not found anything in writing. Anyone saying anything. It's just like, like it just disappears. Except for, of course, the Ethiopian Coptic Church claims that they have it down in Ethiopia. Yeah. Or I thought she yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and some people think that he got it. I mean, you know, there's all these different options, but we really know. It's the warehouse in Washington, D.C. Yeah. <laughs> I, saw the do I saw the documentary on it. It's a crate that looks like many other millions of crates. Of unless, the <laughs> unless you talk to Kyle Rickman at the Temple Institute. Yeah, that's right. We have everything we need. Yep. To build the temple. Everything. Does that include the ark? We have everything we need. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're tied pretty closely to America, so, you know, we have some agreement there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So anyhow, <coughs> um, in response to, to this message, we're told at the end of chapter 1 that Zerubbabel and Joshua began rebuilding the temple. Now, for Zerubbabel to do that, 
took a lot of courage. Because, remember, the walls of Jerusalem still aren't rebuilt. So they have no defenses. These guys still don't want them to rebuild it. In fact, what happens? We're told that they confront them. And they have to send back to Susa, the capital, to find out what to be done. And it just, by God's design, they find the decree, and the king comes back and says, hey, yeah, we found the decree. The temple's supposed to be built. Why isn't it finished? Give them everything they need. In fact, levy a tax to provide for it. You know, and I want sacrifices done for my, for my sake and my son's sake. Get after it. So God does step in. But, you know, it took a lot of courage. And I would say this, Zerubbabel, in, in his defense, he let things slide because as the governor, he had to think about the survival of his people. And for him to then say, okay, we'll go ahead and rebuild it. We'll take the risk. I mean, he's a guy who would feel the responsibility because he's of the royal line. These are his people. He should be their king. He's their governor. And he cares about them. I really do believe that that was a part of why he let it go on. But he, when, when, the, when the word of the Lord comes to the prophet of the Lord, he says, okay, let's do it. Now, in the second message, beginning here in verse 1 of chapter 2, God promises to make the temple glorious. You know, and it says, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, uh, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? There was a few. And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes? Is nothing? Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you. And uh, according to the word I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. When did he make that promise? When he came out of Egypt? Mm -hmm. When did he promise that his spirit would always remain among them? <laughs> well, many times. No, no, no. Sure. No, there's one. The key one, I, I, I think what he's alluding to here, is you remember after the golden calf incident, God moved his tent outside the camp, and Moses begged him to come back in. And eventually he did. And he promised, okay, I will come in your midst and I will be among you. So there was, you know, there was a time when, when God had removed himself from him. <coughs> But he came back to them. And I, I think that's what he's alluding to here. Uh, and so, uh, he, he remained. Now, I don't see God making the temple glorious as a reference to Herod's temple construction. You know, this, this temple was uh, pretty rustic. It was pretty small, rugged. Uh, you know, with good T-111 siding. <laughs> Uh, I mean, we're talking the basics. <laughs> Mine's getting soggy. That kind of hurts. Um, <laughs> are we yeah. talking premium or are we talking like uh, number three grade? Here? Three grade, yeah. Three grade T T one eleven. Yeah, like my old house was made. Probably LP. Uh, yeah, yeah. LP. <laughs> LP siding. No. But uh, <laughs> you know, it was it, it you know it was the basic the, the most basic stuff. And if I understand in T one eleven the the most basic siding. Or is there something oh, even yeah. more basic than that? That's pretty basic. Yeah, that's pretty basic. Yeah, that's pretty basic. Lab yeah. siding and jury, most basic. Yeah. Actually, board and bat is your most yeah, basic. Yeah, board and bat, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that would be, yeah. But anyhow, you know, it was a, it was a very basic temple. Now, uh, Herod's temple was larger than Solomon's, and in some ways more glorious. I don't know if you're familiar with how Herod built his temple. But what they did was they built Herod's temple around... Zerubbabel's temple. And when Herod's was finished, then they dismantled Zerubbabel's and carried it out piece by piece. So there was always an intact temple <laughs> to worship. But Herod's was that much bigger. I mean, it was humongous in comparison to this thing. Yep. The temple they built was probably only about three times the size of this room. I mean, it was very small. It was about the size of the tabernacle. You know, very small temple. It wasn't anything, anything even close to, to Solomon's temple. 
And Solomon's temple was impressive. It was one of the seven wonders of, of, of the ancient world. But this is not a reference to Herod's temple. I don't believe. Um, I think Solomon's was more beautiful than Herod's. But uh, this is probably, most likely, a reference when God says, I'll make it glorious, is a reference to Jesus' visit to the temple. Now, it was Herod's temple he visited. But God's visible presence in contrast to his hidden glory. I think that's what he's really talking about there. Or, next option is, it'll be the millennial temple wherein Jesus will dwell. And he will be there. God's very presence. In person. Bodily. So it's one of those one of those references. But he says, I will make it glorious. And so God was pleased. <laughs> you know, he said, y'all are looking at it, and, and all you see is a, is, is a little dinky temple. But I see obedience. And that pleased God. That was, that was the key. Uh, and, and God said, I'll take care of making it glorious. Now, Remember, for them, it would be a, a very important thing because this is the temple of their God. And you don't give them something second rate. Uh, I, I think this is something that we, as typical Protestants, don't fully understand. I, I think I didn't really understand the significance of what this means until uh, two summers ago, I went uh, with Dr. House on a tour of the uh, seven churches. Turkey, Turkish tour, and uh, we stopped on a on an island. Um, there might be, it might have even been the Isle of Patmos, but there was a uh, Greek Orthodox <coughs> monastery there, and it was gaudy with its ornateness until you understood, because they were explaining it. At the time that it was built, this was considered the most beautiful artwork that you could put together. And they had made this place as beautiful as they could for God's sake. And they had a chapel, sanctuary thing that they poured all their artistic ability into and it was to only be used for worshiping God. And it was to be a holy site and a special place that God would delight in. And that when they went there, they knew, I'm, going, I'm coming to worship the Lord. That's why I'm here. Uh, and it really struck me because uh, at that time, uh, uh, you know, churches are building, you know, at, at this time period, churches build a, a combination gymnasium, banquet hall, and rec center, and auditorium. Now, that's not to say you can't do multiple use. For example, church where I go to now, their auditorium every Sunday morning when church is over, we put up all the chairs because Sunday night they're going to have Awanas there. And on the floor of the auditorium is the Awana circle. <laughs> you know, taped onto the car. I mean, you have to have it. It's the only it's the only space they have. They don't have choice. But they still built it as a sanctuary. But they're doing double duty until they can someday afford more facilities. Uh, but it really bothers me. Huh? The, the concept of that is the, you know, being a good steward. Yeah, being a good steward. Because you know this is the space that's available to us, and we want to utilize it to every possible benefit of God's yeah. glory. And so sometimes you have to put up with those things. That's right, you do. Now what bothers me is when a church goes the opposite direction in the sense of, <coughs> and, I, and I've seen churches, you know, they, 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 they couldn't build everything all at once, so the first thing they do build is a multi-use center with the idea that when time comes, we'll build an auditorium. Uh, like the uh, church that uh, my wife was a member of before we got married. It was a Chinese church up in the Dallas area. And, uh, and, and, and I visited it. And they had their Sunday school classes. And they had their rec center that they worshipped in. And it was very interesting. They ate lunch every Sunday together. And so in the back of their auditorium, or what they were using for an auditorium, was the kitchen. 
and it, and it had a, this board, you know, it was closed up. And when the service was over, they dropped the board down, and it became the serving thing. And everybody stayed and ate. And then did all their meetings and all their choir rehearsals and everything. And they went home about 2.30, 3 o'clock, and, and they were done for the day. But when they could, they built a place set aside for worshiping God. They still have that where they have their lunches together, but now they would worship over there and come, come to there. Well, I think there is something significant about making a distinction. Uh, granted, our churches are not, are not temples, but I believe that it is significant. You're saying a lot to God by how you go about worshiping Him. And that there is a value to setting aside a center where God is always the focus of attention. And we do other things. We have fellowship. We do activities. But let's, when we can afford it, let's do it somewhere else. Let's not make this a do-all facility. Uh, and I, I remember reading one article where a guy noted that you know, our churches went from being beautiful places with great acoustics to square boxes. And, uh, and, it, and it says a lot about our view of God. So they were disappointed because they couldn't make something beautiful. And God reassures them and says, that's okay, I'll make it beautiful by my presence. But that was the best they could do. That was the best they could offer. Um, now, third message. God promises he's going to bless the people. And uh, uh, beginning in verse 10, he notes that, you know, uh, the, the, the work comes and God says, Now, ask the priest concerning the law, saying, If one carries holy meat in the field of, in, in the fold of his garment, and with the edge he touches bread or stew, wine or oil, or any food, will it become holy? They go, Well, of course not. Well, if one is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these, will it be unclean? <coughs> They go, well, of course it becomes unclean. That's the whole point. He says, so is the people. So is this nation before me, says the Lord. And so is every work of their hands. And what they offer there is unclean. So, while in disobedience, they were unclean before the Lord. And everything they did was unclean. That's the whole point. But he promises then after that, you know, he says they, he'd been cursing them. He'd been cursing them because of their negligence. But, he said, from the time you started rebuilding the temple, finishing up the work, I've begun blessing you. Go check it out. And so God responded to them uh, by blessing them. Now, let's ask this question. If I am obedient to the Lord, does that guarantee me blessing? No. <laughs> sure. Not, not financial. Yeah. Why not? Of some sort, but <laughs> well, how come they get blessed and I don't? Because <laughs> you didn't send your $10 a week here. <laughs> to either Larry Lee or Robert Tilton right. or... Yeah. Yeah. The right guy. It's got to be the right guy. Right. <laughs> yeah. You don't follow on the right plan or the new deal. Or Bishop so and so. Well, let's ask this question. Why is it that they get blessed materially for obedience, but you and I don't? Abraham. No, not the Abrahamic. Right. You're close though. The, Mos the Mosaic Covenant. Because they were they were God's people like an actual governmental right under the bed. and under the Mosaic Covenant, which they were still under, God had made a direct link between material prosperity and obedience. So what is what God is really saying here is, I'm keeping my covenant. Now in the New Testament, we don't we're not given that. There is never a direct connection made between obedience and material blessing. The closest you get is God says he will provide seed to the sower. So if someone wants to give to God's work, God will enable them by, through wealth to be able to give more to God's work. But beyond that, there's no promise of material blessing. It says we'll be taken care of. Yeah, we'll be taken care of. Right. 
Right. All of our needs will be taken care of. But there is an understood except <coughs> during times of persecution, things like that. But our hope is our, our hope is in the life we get, the abundant life yeah. that we get yeah. through walking with the Savior. That's right. And the, the great and it's not it's, and, 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 and it's not material. It's spiritual, it's emotional, it's 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 eternal. Somehow they're connected to the Lamb in a way that that we're not unreal to yeah. us. I mean it's just can't we can't we're never going to have it. Right? At least, since we're not in an agrarian society. You know, if we were in an agrarian society, we, we might see more of God's blessing in that way. Um, I got I have an anecdote for that because I worked for a farm when I was in college. And while I was there, they had were holding very tightly under the reins of the farm. And, and they had people who were supposed to be managing the farm, but they weren't. The owners were not letting them do their job. They were involved in every little aspect yeah. of it. And, Over supervising. Right. And I don't know, they were Christians, professing Bible believing Baptist Christians. And for like five years, the farm didn't do anything. In fact, it lost money. They had a bunch of their crop go bad and stuff like that. And I'm not saying that this is, was the Lord, but I wouldn't, wouldn't <laughs> be surprised. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised because. Um, after I had left, they really realized what they were doing and, and turned it around and, and uh, they, they let their managers do their job, trusted them because they had been working for them for a long time. And uh, ever since then, they've been doing really well. And mm. the crops have been coming right? in. Yeah. And uh, you know, I'm not going to say that that is the blessing that they are enjoying, but I would <coughs> I would, you know, be surprised. <coughs> Wouldn't be surprised. I've seen that over and over happen that way. Uh, yeah. Um, I was going to give a good example of that. Uh, I worked with a guy when I was in the uh, army. Uh, the army, in its infinite wisdom, uh, sent me to an engineering agency. I had one engineering course in college called Farm Electricity, How to Wire a Barn. So I got assigned to a Department of Defense engineering agency as the army representative of one of them. So I sat in a cubicle doing engineering analysis for transportability of military equipment. Now, next to me was guys who had worked for NASA, General Motors, Ford Corporation, you know, <laughs> who had master's degrees in mechanical engineering and aerospace engineering. And so I practiced my greatest engineering skill, skill was, was determining trajectories. You know, I would make paper wads and bomb the different cubicles and disrupt <laughs> their work. But uh, beyond that, I didn't have much to do with that. It was constructive. But one of the guys that worked for us had been a pastor. And then he went to work for the government as an engineer. And he said that he had been in, in an area of like West Virginia or, or, or somewhere like that. And he said there were Amish farmers that were all, you know, all natural farmers, the whole bit. Uh, the wagons, you know, nothing modern. They said they were scattered around this area. They weren't an enclave, but they would have a farm here, a farm there. And he said there was a couple of three years where they had some serious droughts. But he said these guys, he was convinced that they were right with God because they were completely dependent on the weather. And he said it was amazing how there would be these little thunderclouds come and rain on their farms. <laughs> And they were getting crops when no one else was. And he said, it happened more than once. Since, you know, he, he, this guy was convinced that it was God blessing them. And I think so. God still does those things. Uh, but it's not a guarantee like it was under the Mosaic Covenant. And... Uh, so, but he does that. He blesses them. Then the fourth message, he talks to Zerubbabel. And I think this is really neat. Because the word comes to Zerubbabel, and he says, tell him, I'll shake heaven and earth, I'll overthrow the throne of kingdoms, I'll destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms, I'll overthrow the chariots, and those who ride in them, the horses and the riders shall come down, every one of them, uh, every one by the sword of his brother. What is he talking about there? When is this going to happen? This is the day of the Lord. The great tribulation. It says, this day is coming. <coughs> Notice what he says then. It's Zerubbabel. In that day, 
Notice it says, it says the Lord of hosts. Again, taking note of God as the sovereign judge. I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. Zerubbabel has a destiny to be one of the most significant players in the science kingdom. I mean, the signet ring. What's the significance of the signet ring? Authority. 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 Authority.